Hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to have you with us here tonight. Thank you for joining us on our very first session in this extension session series that provides a deep dive into Renew Sustainable House Day program. My name is Rachel Goldlust, and I'm pleased to be kicking off this series. We have people tuned in from all over the country tonight from a wide variety of unceded lands. I want to acknowledge that I live and I'm currently working on the unceded lands of the Wadawurrung people of coastal Victoria. I express my gratitude in the sharing of this land, our sorrow for the personal, spiritual and cultural costs of that sharing, and my hope that we may walk forward together in harmony and in the spirit of healing. Here at Renew, we are very grateful for the support of our sponsors, and in particular, this evening, our gold sponsor, the New South Wales, New South Wales Architects Registration Board, who are integral to making Sustainable House Day and this extension session series possible. Tonight is the first session in this eight-part series that follows on from Sustainable House Day, the premier event showcasing what's possible in the sustainable building industry, brought to you by the good folk at Renew. We are starting tonight from the beginning with From Dream to Drawing Board to help explore some very important first decisions. It's ensuring that you have the necessary first steps in place and are approaching your build or renovation in an informed manner. We're going to be looking at collecting your team and successfully navigating through the myriad of choices to reach your desired outcome. And we'll also be discovering that you may need to make some adaptations, which can occur for many reasons. These could be changes in location, budget, planning laws, etc. And we'll go into the depths of those tonight. So tonight is just the first and we'll hope you will join us for the seven more sessions coming over the next month designed to take you deeper into the home building and renovation sector. If you haven't already, there's still time to purchase an extension session pass, which gives you access to all of the sessions. We'll pop a link in the chat now so that you can access the rest of this incredible series. So before I introduce the panel, I'll quickly introduce myself. Um, my name is Dr. Rachel Goldless. I'm a sustainability researcher here at Renew. And among the many things that I do, I've been working on the getting off gas and helping out with the green rebuild toolkit. I'm a qualified town planner and have a passion for natural building styles and modalities and a long-standing interest in sustainable, energy efficient and comfortable homes that tread lightly on the earth. I've worked in environmental education and I love helping people find out about ways that they can interact with sustainable design, materials and passive solar ideas. And tonight, I'm very excited to be joined by three very special panellists, all experts across their field who will be approaching this topic from different perspectives. So first up, we welcome Simone Schenkel. Simone Schenkel grew up and studied architecture in Germany, the home of the passive house movement. She has used the passion, experience and knowledge she gained from her upbringing and architectural studies in Germany to create spaces that are affordable, healthy, thermally comfortable, energy efficient and resilient for future generations. She's a certified passive house designer on a mission to make energy efficient spaces a staple in the Australian landscape without it costing the earth. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Simone. Okay, great to be here again. <laughs> And we would also like to welcome Petra Richter. Petra and Marcel Richter are the homeowners of Marcel's Strawbell House, a featured home of Sustainable House Day 2024. Nestled in the snowy mountains, this Strawbell House embodies a 20 year dream of sustainable living. Recycled materials and thick straw walls paired with European windows ensure a year round comfort. With minimal heating required from a wood-fired stove, solar warmth further enhances the cosiness. The home also boasts a greenhouse, chicken coop and beekeeping, fostering a complete eco-conscious lifestyle. It is so great to have you with us tonight, Petra, and bringing the all-important homeowner perspective. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And last but by no means least, we welcome Sonia Markovic. Sonia Markovic is the CEO and co-founder of Evertat, an award-winning home renovation platform powered by AI. The platform acts as a trusted and transparent source on sustainability in the global home improvement market and turns renovation choices into climate solutions. 
It unlocks a brand new value proposition for sustainable renovations and operates as a disruptive force by deepening the relationship between all players in the ecosystem. We're very excited to have you tonight, Sonia. Thank you, Rachel. And I'm equally excited being here tonight. So thank you. So we can get started. Um, and during our discussion, I will be putting viewers' questions to our panel. Please, if you could put your questions into the Zoom's Q&A window at the bottom of your screen as we go, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Please be mindful that questions that are really specific or detailed may not be appropriate for a panel event setting. And as I like to say, the best questions are actually questions. So I'll start with Simone. Can I ask you um, how you have worked with clients to help get them out of the dream phase and into something a little bit more tangible? Yes, for sure. Of course. Now, how long is a piece of string? You know, there are millions of things and we're going to talk about in more detail today. But I guess one of the first things that's really important is to get clear about your design brief. So by that, I mean, is you know, what do you actually want? What do you actually need? And um, not just look at, you know, what's out there. You know, many people often look at display homes, you know, whatever, five bedrooms, three bathrooms or whatever. So what I say is, you know, completely ignore what's out there and look about, you know, think about what do I need as a family? What do I need as, you know, or if you're single or a couple, whatever it is, but what do I need to make my life better? And, you know, get clear on really your must-haves, your would-like-to-haves, and then, you know, there is a lot of research that should go into the process before you even approach designer, architect or anyone else. Just getting clear about, you know, what are your goals? Is it more about energy efficiency or are you more interested in the health aspect or are you more interested in the sustain sustainability factor that everything needs to be locally sourced or maybe is it everything? So that there are lots of things that go into it. Um, but yeah, I would say just as a snippet, the design brief is the big, big thing. You have to be clear what you actually want, what you need, uh, and also think a little bit about your budget, you know, how much money you might actually have. But I think we might uh, talk about that potentially a bit later. Yeah, we will. So what else kind of goes into a design brief? And I'm going to make a, a little bit of an assumption that not everyone, not every designer's design brief is the same. No, definitely not. It, it's really com completely different things. So um, like I mentioned before, I would rather, you know, go about it. What are the things that I need? So for instance, you know, many, many people might think, oh, I need a guest bedroom. But then, you know, and especially if you think about building sustainable and affordably, you know, we can't just go bigger, bigger, bigger. I hope that most people that listen in tonight are on the same page that we can't just keep building those huge mansions. We have to be more practical, uh, think about the terms of less is more, and how can we create spaces that are fairly compact, but still feel spacious and bright and have all the, the usage we need. So, you know, think about, for instance, you know, uh, do I really need a guest bedroom or, you know, how often do we actually have someone staying over? Do you really need a dedicated bedroom that is used once or twice a year? Maybe not. So what about, can you create multifunctional spaces that are maybe used as a study and maybe you have a fold down Murphy bed or you have a sofa bed or whatever it is, but be a bit more inventive. How can I use my space or you know, the, the spaces in a way that they're actually you know, multi-purpose, you know, that you can use them for more than, than one thing? Um, you know, that's one thing, uh, but also thinking further than about materials or colors or the health aspect, you know, and um, one thing as well is, you know, not everything you get in a hardware store, and I don't want to name and shame here to say, you know, which hardware store, but not everything that you get in a hardware store is actually good for you. So there are quite a lot of products on the market that are quite harmful, you know, that have lots of toxins and are off-gassing, you know, so again, it goes back to the research, you have to research, you know, what you're getting. Um, and similar, not everything you see on TV shows, again, I don't want to name and shame any, you know, uh, home home shows or renovator shows, not everything you see there is actually good or necessary. So I think there needs to be, you know, a bit more thought into that as well. I mean, it is kind of hard. Um, I'll, I'll move on. But I was just thinking it is kind of hard, because we do get lots of inspiration from lots of places. And so it is kind of hard to separate out, oh, hang on, maybe I want a little bit that looks like that, but actually I want a little bit. So I'm sure people come to this yeah. project with quite confused 
ideas about what it is they want. So I'll ask you, Petra, um, thinking back to the start as a homeowner, thinking back to the start of your journey, what do you wish you'd have known or thought about in the beginning to help you with your project? Actually, there is nothing that I would have changed because <laughs> I'm lucky to have a husband. He's amazing. He, um, so our dream was 20 years ago, we saw a strawberry house while we were traveling in New Zealand. And we were so lucky that those people showed us the house and we were allowed to touch it and, you know, feel it and look at it. So since that day, I always wanted a strawberry house, but it took us 20 years. Now, finally, I've got it. <laughs> so big thing is never give up on dreams and don't let other people talk you out of it. Because I believe in, like you just said, Simone, so beautiful, like how you said, uh, it has to be practical, not too big, yeah. feel comfortable. And uh, and uh, we had to move to Chindabine, so I get my straw bell house because my husband believed it's a waste building it in a warmer climate. So that's why we built it here. And he, um, yeah, he's very clever. Like he thinks a long time before we even started building. And we had so many friends that are into that kind of building already. So we have a friend that did the straw bell for us. So we, you know, did lots of research before we even started. So, yeah. What what was part of that research? Do you, can you remember? My husband is here. Come here. <laughs> what was part of the research, Michelle? Mm -hmm. Well, it's like, you know, where you get the straw bells from and that like, are they safe to use and not, you know, are the animals going to get in? And there's so many questions, you know, when you've never built a straw bell. So, yeah. it, it's more about like, um, I don't know, just how to make the job easier and um, put the strawing more efficiently and, and render it more efficiently for me. So, yeah, all those kind of questions. I have a friend who's, he's a, I call him a straw master. But um, yeah, just to make it even better, and, and like he said, I think this house is probably the fastest house he's ever done. Well, I guess hopefully after all of that planning and all of that thinking, it made the project a bit smoother. Uh, we're gonna. Yeah. Yeah. So before we get too far down the materials rabbit hole, because there's going to be plenty more sessions to talk about those sort of things, um, I'll go to you, Sonia, and. How do you encourage clients when they first come to you to think about sustainability? Because it is a pretty big topic and it can be approached from many uh, attributes or many avenues. So how does that conversation usually go when you start mm, off? Yes. Great question. I think um, maybe I, I start actually um, even through my personal journey, um, how we happened actually to develop that solution and we are still um, optimizing everything here as well. Um, 2017, there was um, a big event, a cyclone went through Queensland. We have a house in Queensland and it was really badly damaged. Um, with that um, came basically the decision uh, to build back better and to fix these things, um, but to ensure that if we are doing that investment, if we are spending money, that the money is spent wisely and that it's improving actually thermal comfort. We knew where are the weak points in, in the in the build and we really wanted to, to have some improvements, but we also wanted to make sure that um, the investment we put in material choices in professionals is actually a conscious investment into either the um, the local economy or we support, you know, even local, um, let's say, manufacturers or supply. Um, so there was this whole, I think, like a range of, of questions we, we tried to get answers to. And we couldn't get the answers, as simple as that. It made it really complicated and it felt at times as doing a PhD in something. <laughs> And I came back actually to the simple question, why is it so difficult for someone who wants to do the right thing to do the right thing and to spend the money wisely? So, and I thought, well, if we have, if we are going to, through that experience, you know, let's put that because my background is actually product des design and experience, you know, let's get that and catalyze that into a platform solution and really try to, um, for many people to access basically um, principles and ways to explore and make better decisions, but also framing it in, in something more purposeful, which 
um, accelerates and boosts actually sustainability across the sector. Like when we are looking at the, the total spending, for example, we had that insane peak during the pandemic um, when renovations were incentivized. We had a $15 billion spending. But the outcomes of all of that money spent is really poor. So how can we turn actually these spending and renovation decisions more in, into climate actions and make it really worthwhile for us, but as well, you know, for future generations? Like Petra's house is a great sample, you know, to, to say, well, if ever you sell that, the future owner will have an absolute amazing property which performs well. So all that information stored actually within the home, we are able actually to showcase and demonstrate that through the platform solution we have built and also to support actually a new homeowner to make a conscious decision around the property purchase. Um, coming back to you know, selecting even professionals and what is the sustainable principles. We have created six core um, categories um, to, to make it simple, which ranges from health, comfort, affordability, um, energy and water efficiency, environmental and social um, aspect, and as well carbon emissions. So within that, you have the opportunity, for example, to set goals. And that taps exactly into the area what Simona mentioned, creating actually that brief or contributing to it with um, a set of goals, which are pretty much around your needs and aspirations. And that helps actually clarifying, but also prioritizing um, certain sustainable outcomes you want to drive. And creates a fairly new, um, I think, base for a con conversation with a professional, with an architect. And hopefully it can support your needs and aspirations within that conversation, which are without actually getting outcrowded along the way, because we know all the journey is quite, can be at times really stressful as well, um, with a lot of pressure points. And I think it's really about supporting actually the ownership of these um, basic elements, you know, what do you need and what do you want? That's so interesting, Sonia. I mean, do you feel like over your time, and I guess um, Simone could probably answer this too, do you feel like the, um, I don't know, the baseline of the conversation has shifted significantly? Um, I feel like in terms of not just expectations, but yeah, the the idea of why someone should want to, why would they want to build a sustainable home? Yeah, so Donna, do you want to start? I can jump in. And I think, you know, uh, I don't want to talk too much about COVID. I think everyone has some, you know, not so good memories about this time. But I think the one thing that came out of it was that we were forced to be at home. And most mm -hmm. people finally realized how bad our homes are because back in the day you know you 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 were only home you know on the weekends and you kind of could cope but you know when people were actually home all day they realized oh my god you know this is not bearable you know we have to do something so I think there was a bit of shift in people you know that that you can do things differently but I, but I think it goes all back to education and you know this is why I love when you and while I often on board you know if anyone asks me do you want to help in any webinar or something else yes of course um because I, I think education is key and uh, what I found when I came to Australia is that often people just are so unaware. And if I, you know, oversimplify it a little bit, that there are kind of two kinds of people often in Australia. The ones that just, you know, half freeze to death because, you know, they don't want to turn on their heater or they don't want to turn on their, their split system in summer, you know, because it costs too much money. So they're sitting there with their beanies and their arc boots and their scarves in the house and just freeze half to death. And then you have the other, the, the, the opposite of them, the people that just have the heater running all the time, they spend an absolute fortune in their heating and cooling bills, and they're just complaining how crazy expensive everything is. But what I found is most people, they just stick with that, you know, and they, they don't even want to explore how much would it actually cost or what do you actually need to do to improve my house? Mm -hmm. And obviously now a, a big or huge renovation can cost a lot of money, but um there are lots of simple things you can do to improve the efficiency of, a, of your home, you know, in terms of insulation, you know, it, it's really uh, the low hanging food or, you know, trough ceiling, things like that. Uh, so, you know, there are lots of things you can actually do that don't cost a lot of money. 
but it's the, the problem that most people don't know about those things. And, you know, the more we talk about it and the more people talk about it and the more it gets out to everyone, you know, that's why we're here for, you know, to educate and to, to get people to question, can we actually do it? And, you know, what would the change be? And what is actually thermal comfort? And the, the difficulty is, you know, when you look at out in whatever real estate magazines or, you know, architectural magazines, it all looks beautiful. And what I find so shocking is, in a sense, that, you know, most real estate photos look amazing. You know, you have the beautiful styled kitchen, the beautiful styled whatever living areas, but the houses are, excuse my French, shit. You know, they're, they're freezing ass. Uh, and, and you know, often you pay a, a million or in some areas even two or three million, depending on the area you are, you know, for this glorious looking house that is basically just a glorified tent because they're just drafting, they're cold, they're freezing. Um, there might even be mold in the house. You might even get sick. So there, there's all of kinds of things and people just don't know those things or don't realize those things. Well, I think that's where we're coming in from this from this conversation as well, not just to educate people that there are options, but about why they should look at those options. Because to me, those kind of outcomes are because, um, you know, those those aren't necessarily things that are being pushed by certain builders or designers or architects who don't feel that those things are relevant or important to their clients. And so they allow certain homes to be built. Mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like the, obviously the people in this panel are not going to support those kind of projects. So it does come back to how to choose your team. And we will get onto that maybe a little bit later in terms of like, yeah, how do you choose a team that is going to support you? But we're going to look quickly into planning because I think it's something that people get quite turned off by mm -hmm. or they feel that it's something that they can't um, manage or navigate themselves in this space. So um, what are some of the issues that you hear about or you think are the most common problems that people have when it comes to getting um, either their planning permit or getting their building permit or going through that process? Um, I'll ask you, Simone, to start mm. with that one and then maybe we'll get Petra's view on that. Yeah, I think there is a lot of confusion in, in, in within the consumers, you know, what's a planning permit, what's a building permit and when do you need what? So I, I guess just, and, and you know, you Rachel probably definitely can jump in as well. What I would say is, you know, typically for most projects you need a building permit. And in short, as soon as you do any structural work or any plumbing work or any electrical work, or once you get to a certain scope, you just need a building permit. There is no way around that. Um, however, a planning permit is not always needed. So, you know, one thing you can do at the start is, you know, you might call a your council, your local council, just check what you want to do. Or if you have a designer or builder, you now get them to check. Um, but what we started doing or what I started doing uh, in, in terms of work is to not leave it just to word of mouth. So typically what we try to do is, you know, even if you don't need a planning permit, get something in writing out of council. Um, because we had this one particular case where the client spoke with council several times and council said, oh, no, all good. You don't need a permit. Um, the, um, the construction documentation, everything was ready. The builder was ready to, ready to start. And suddenly council said, oh, I really saw you do need a planning permit. And then suddenly, yeah, that everything had to be prepared for the planning permit and the project got delayed by entire year, which was a big nightmare. However, if you put together or you get your designer architect to put together some plans, um, uh, and if, if you don't need a planning permit, it's it's much, much simpler and doesn't take much time. Just some basic plans that you show that you comply with all planning regulations, with overlooking and setback and site coverage and whatnot. Uh, and then typically it with most councils, it takes a few weeks. It might just cost whatever, $100, $200. And then you get in writing, no planning permit is needed. Or, you know, or if it doesn't turn out that well, you know, you might need a planning permit, but at least, you know, in now black and white. Because what happens in order to get your building permit, you need something in writing that either says you have a planning permit or you don't need a planning permit. So just, you know, the word is not enough. Um, but not sure maybe if you want to talk a bit more, Rachel, about actual planning permit. Um, I mean, it's it's sort of a question that's a bit chicken and egg. It's kind of like, do you, um, I mean, I guess my question back, I'll probably ask, Petra, this question is, do you feel that you need someone to support you through all of that process? Or is it something that you felt that you could do on your own? 
Because I think a lot of people feel that without support, they can't do it on their own. So did you have a designer or architect or a builder or a planner that supported you through your project, Petra? Well, I'm lucky that my husband is uh, so in tune with building like so environmental friendly, but we did choose also a uh, architect that is into using rammed earth in the houses, like into totally into the environment as well, like we are. So definitely highly recommend not choosing any architect, choose one that really understands the sun, the lights and everything, you know, and not build big places or create big places, make it practical. So. I'm yeah, not. and I feel like that's what I learned from the houses that I visited on Sustainable House Day. I managed to visit three and all of those projects felt like they had the same mantra, which was we had someone really great that supported us through this project. And yes, without that person, whether it was the designer, whether it was a building designer, whether it was a project manager, whether it was just a builder who was really good, all of those things, people felt much more supported by that. So I guess this brings us back to Sonia to like, how, who are the key people that you need to think about for a building project or a renovation project and how do you find them? Yeah, so when we onboard, for example, or when we talk to, to architects, um, building designers, builders, um, we ask them actually, um, what is your expertise? What is your, what are the specific skills? We attract, of course, um, probably those ones in, in the sector who have um, a track record in, in certain expertise around sustainability. And I'm not just talking about um, seven or seven and a half star rated energy efficiency. I'm talking here also about material choices, biomaterials, um, the, which come with such a um, range of co-benefits. And, and that's exactly what Petra was um, mentioning. I think um, diversifying, for example, the material choices help, you know, also for you to not just create um, maybe an avenue of alternative materials to use. It might not be under any constraints of supply chain. So you might have um, easy access or the builder has easy access to it, but it comes with energy efficiency, with comfortable home and we highlight these expertise um, and when you go, for example, through goal settings, you get matched um, based on your goals and your needs um, with the right experts in your local area. As I'm saying that um, a bit consciously because we are just building up. We have a lot of talks with um, experts. We are onboarding them. So um, we can't, you know, at the moment... Um, have everywhere um, someone, but I think the, the core principles are already in there um, and we are extending. Um, so we are in a lot of talks in particular on the east side of Australia um, with a range of um, builders, architects, passive house designers, and even experts in biophilic and home biology because the needs are in, in all that ranges. Um, you know, you might have a certain allergy need um, or you might be very sensitive or you have a child with certain special needs. You should be able actually to match or be matched with, with an expert in that area who can really support that. And, um, and that's exactly, I think, where we want to make a difference and um, be very unique um, to location and the personal, the human-centric needs. And then hopefully we, we create actually these fantastic um, collaborations and projects um, which have amazing outcomes. I mean, it, you have nailed it in terms of it was a space that was crying for that kind of oversight and organisation in terms of bringing together trusted parties that can work together to, you know, who are all loosely headed in the same direction in terms of, um, you know, the kinds of structures and, and houses that we would like to, people to be living in and enjoying that are healthy and comfortable and don't cost the earth. So I guess the my next question would be, because we're moving quite swiftly along, would be around budgets. And you mentioned it earlier on, Simone, in terms of um, how to manage kind of realistic expectations and also I was thinking, like, is it a good idea to start with a firm budget and work backwards from that in terms of, like, 
you know, if I only have 400,000 and yeah. I want, you know, this much square meters and you say, well, how about you try and halve those square meters and we could maybe <laughs> do that? Like, does it work that way? Yeah, I think budget is a tricky question. I often talk with clients and, you know, often um, or, or potential clients and often people are a bit, you know, scared and think, you know, if I tell my budget to the builder, they will charge more. Or, you know, many people think that, you know, you have to hold your cards back or, you know, don't say what you can spend because then it will definitely cost that much or even more. But that's actually the wrong way around. You know, what I would recommend everyone is, you know, you have to be really open with your budget because whatever your budget is, is your number. Then you need to find someone who's willing to work with you with that. Um, but when it comes to budget, you have to do, again, a little bit more research and work on it. So, you know, I would recommend definitely now speak with your bank or mortgage broker or whatever it is and, you know, be clear what is your budget, but also be realistic. What is your your absolute upper limit? You know, how far could you stretch it? And also be mindful to leave a contingency, you know, say if your absolute budget or maximum, you know, before you get hurt is 400, then you actually have to say to the builders or your team, it's a little bit less because you need to leave, I'd say at least 10% or something left over. Mm. Um, but also think about, you know, what happens even if that contingency, if something blows out, can I go any higher? So, you know, you have to be quite clear on what are your numbers or, you know, how far can you go without needing to be a slave for your work? Or you obviously don't want to take a second or third job, you know, be clear what you can afford. Um, but the other thing is, you know, you need to do some research. How far can that money actually take, take me? Or, you know, what could I potentially get for this money? Um, because most people probably have heard that the build cost has, has exploded over the last few years. And what you were able to get just like two or three years ago, you can't get now anymore. Or what you would get a, a nice custom design new build three years ago, you have to spend now on a volume build. And so therefore mm. things have changed quite drastically, which means then again, you know, think about more carefully, what do you actually need rather than, you know, what, what everyone is doing. Mm. And, you know, and don't compare volume builds with a custom build or, you know, with a, with a small builder. It's unfortunately different worlds. They speak completely different languages. Um, so, you know, you have to be uh, quite careful with that. And um, like like Sonia had said before, you know, with, the, with your priorities, you know, to get clear on what is important for you. Is it maybe the health aspect? You know, is it, does it make sense to spend a bit more money on, um, for instance, on a heat recovery ventilation system that you, that you have mechanical ventilation and filtered air inside the house or that you avoid humidity buildup and mold? Um, or are you more concerned at reducing your energy bills? Ideally, both should come hand in hand, but it's a, a topic for another uh, webinar series, I think. Um, mm. But yet it's quite important that you think about those things as well. Yeah, they don't they, they don't often come in. I feel like sometimes there's actually two completely separate worlds that are talking about this problem, about how to build homes that are good for us and good for the planet, and um, yeah. they don't seem to necessarily cross over at all. So here's to hoping this is what we do these extension sessions for. Um, yeah. Petra, or, do you mind? Maybe if, maybe if I yeah. could say just one thing as well, what I would recommend as well, you know, to not jump blindly into the process, you know, so A, be open with your budget, whatever it is, and, you know, try to get, uh, you know, if you have your designer and architect, a builder on board as early on as possible, because, you know, no matter how good a designer or architect is, you know, they're not builders, they are not the ones quoting or building your project. So you need to get some actual, you know, figures from a builder or from a quantity surveyor quite early on in the process, making sure that you're on the right track. Or um, if the estimates or the, the, the quantity surveyor, whatever comes in too high, that you can make changes and you want to do, make them early on in the process. You don't want to potentially waste one or two years going for, for council and get all the documentation, everything done. And then at the end of the process, you realize you're hundreds of thousands of dollars short. You know, that that's an absolute nightmare. No one wants, wants to get to that point. So you rather want to find out at early on in the process, if you a, need, need to wait one or two years to save more money, or if you have to change your scope and save money somewhere. Mm. I guess that's I guess that's a, that's a lesson a lot of people would learn the hard way and we're hoping to be able to learn from those mistakes. Um, Petra, did you have any of those kinds of issues in terms of, you know, your project as much as I love that it was a dream that came from an idea and, and took its time, but it did take a fair bit of time. Do you feel like there were things that, I mean, could have happened 
differently to save time or was that just how long the project had to take? Well, we start, it took five years. So from beginning when we bought the block of land till we moved into a house. Um, True. Yeah, because we built it ourselves, my husband and I, so mm. yeah, with friends. Uh, about money is because we, um, so when we sold our second house, we took the opportunity to go home to Austria, spend a whole year on the farm in Austria to spend time with my family and the kids. And we took the opportunity to visit all those places where they ripped houses down and we collected lots of secondhand stuff that we saved from going into landfill. And we, uh, or my husband is amazing, how to build it into the home to give character. So, and we also uh, collected windows from over there. So we had a container anyways, because otherwise people think that's a bit mad shipping, you know, stuff half the earth but we uh, had windows anyways coming from Austria uh, from Poland we ordered them and so we filtered then the whole container uh, with all secondhand stuff kitchen and uh, furniture. wow so you shipped a lot of that stuff over and doors like amazing doors you know the entry door and there's some doors don't even have a lock and kinder wine you don't have to lock anyways <laughs> So we just love old stuff and it's so cozy, you know, and today you, it's quite cold. It was six degrees this morning and we still haven't heated in. I'm still sitting here with the blanket, but, you know, like when in the house you can't come in, it's so cozy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's such a hard thing to try and talk to people when you talk about five years, you know, but yeah. it, it's kind of like it, 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 the outcome is going to be worth the time and the planning and also the, you know, hunting around for secondhand materials. I know that where I live in central Victoria, there's a salvage yard that really struggles to convince people that they should use salvage material. And they have a whole business that's built around trying to encourage people. And it's, it's oftentimes the builder or the carpenters who don't support the homeowners who might want those mm -hmm. feature items and they might want to have something a little it's bit different. It's and more, and it's more work for them or it's a bit of a hassle or it's not 100%, you know, rust proof so they have to put something else on, whatever, like, yes. But their problem, the salvage yard, is not necessarily that there's not enough stuff. It's actually about convincing people to use it. And there's and there's not a lot of support for yeah. people to use recycled materials as well in that space. So um, Designing building goals and sustainable building goals. That's this is a very broad question. So, what are what should be people's priorities? I know we've talked about a design brief and we've talked about a project brief, but how do you weigh up the differences between having, I guess, does practical budgetary goals or needs and design goals and um, sustainability goals? Like, how does once sometimes there's got to be a shift in those priorities. Sonia, do you feel like there's a, a an easy way to battle through those problems? Ah, uh, that that's um, so. I think um, I kept it a little bit. Um, I think individually guided <laughs> in in our approach um, because it is um, often enough uh, slightly always um different and i think the attribution the weights in in certain areas can vary of course um around the needs a general guiding principle would be to really think deeply um about the size for example i i really think this is like <laughs> the the top rule you can actually apply to to everything we do because um it translates immediately also in into um a better budget yep. <laughs> it translates into better options um of quality of material choices um it will also allow you probably to engage actually um with better professionals along the way and i think um this is really something like don't come just from the design point you know don't don't put, you know, just a Pinterest board together and think, oh, yeah, you know, that, and I'm guilty of that probably a long time ago as well when um, we were on that first journey, you know, putting things together and thinking, oh, yeah, I want this, I want that, you know. That's just um, like we are not the professionals. 
we need to find the balanced approach between our needs, but also identifying and clarifying them in the first place, and then being able actually to uh, um, communicate and collaborate in, the, in, in that journey. And I think Petra's journey really points out how important that is also to have some ownership stake, because these journeys are getting often enough really stressful. Um, mm -hmm. They become pressure points around finance and, and so on, you know, and then at some point, what happens is often enough, and I hear that all the time, it becomes so stressful that all the decision making is left actually to the builder or to some other stakeholders, you know. Um, and what happens is they will be done in economical senses, um, but not necessarily in, in terms of your needs and aspirations. So this is really a critical part and understanding that power behind it is quite important. And I think once you are you have that clarity, what do you want and what do you want to drive and how do you want to stick with these things? It becomes a far um, stronger beacon in that journey to, to really keep going, you know, with, with that intention. And maybe a straw bale house, maybe you know, other material choices or even design choices. Um, I come from building less. Um, and actually that that's the biggest opportunity to to leave a small footprint and then really to to make it very, very clear um what are your needs, what are your aspirations, and stick with them. Make sure that they become a very strong point of prioritization. Don't let them be outcrowded by other things, you know. You can discuss colors and tabs and even kitchen bench tops. I don't mind, you know, down the track. But these basic principles are really, really important. And I think um, they leave not just homes which are very purposeful, which are highly energy efficient, uh, efficient. they also create homes with character. And for example, if you, if you are able actually to to integrate, um, you know, or repurpose existing materials, assist, uh, existing things into your home, and we have currently a really great example um, of a renovator in Sydney doing exactly that. It creates an amazing, um, full of life actually living space, and I think um, we should really be aware of like when we are spending that money to create something we want to live in and not for resale value in the first place. Mm -hmm. We should be able actually to live in, in these homes and really feel um, great about them yeah, and really be proud about them. Mm -hmm. So that's for, for me a really important part maybe to, to have a guiding you know decision. And if, if I can say something, maybe it's about mm -hmm. you know, the... Um, think smartly again about your choices because typically when building or renovating it's the architectural features that cost money and the big you know the, the, the thing is people often think uh, building a sustainable home or a passive house is expensive now the thing is building is expensive adding a bit better windows or a bit more insulation is just really a fraction a tiny fraction of your build cost but often people spend a fortune on the architectural features you know mm. people uh, often don't hesitate to put in the marble, marble stone bench top or to put in the huge alfresco or the, the pool or something. No one would ever ask, what's my payback for my marble stone bench top or what's my payback for my alfresco? But people straight away ask, what's my payback for the insulation or what's my payback for the ventilation system? Mm. I, I, I often think, you know, it's such a wrong way of approaching things. You know, what's your payback for health? You know, and and. I'm not sure if, if people here have heard much about the passive or standard or mechanical ventilation. There has been so much research worldwide, you know, how um, where people are sick, you know, with asthma or especially kids, you know, that suffer from asthma and other health issues. And if you actually move into a healthy home where there's no mold, where there's proper ventilation, those issues, symptoms pretty much vanish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what is the, the, the monetary value of that? You know, people don't put a payback time to that. So mm -hmm. I think it's a bit more thinking about the, the comfort and your health. And obviously, you know, money is important. You need to be able to afford it. But 
but maybe you know rather getting the marble stone bench top or rather than getting your curved wall or getting a polished concrete floor you know or order whatever the hundred thousand dollar kitchen maybe you know go a bit more simple there and put yep. it in your health or you know towards sustainability feature so there are quite a few options and I think also as energy prices continue to rise, it is going to be more about affordability of maintaining the home and that it really should be written into the costing of of, it, of any design would be the ongoing maintenance of, in, of heating and cooling. And, you know, if you weigh up the difference in, like you said, in, in investing in proper insulation, proper windows, then you can look at what your ongoing costs are going to be and that they can be, you know, seem less, more moderate over time. But it is a very good point about we don't think about the payback of a marble bench top. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to go back to Sonia's point about, you know, the personalization of home and being proud of it. I was thinking about Petra when you had people come to visit your house for Sustainable House Day. What were some of the things that, I mean, I know everyone's probably going to want to talk about straw bale and we are going to talk about materials in one of our later sessions. So we won't get too stuck into the straw bale aspect of it. But what were some of the other things that people were really keen to talk to you about in terms of your home? So there was lots of questions, of course, like how the what, like how it's made, like how the straw bales were put in and the renda, what goes on the outside of renda. So yeah, lots of questions about that and the timber that we use, the recycling, where we got it from. So yeah. So it was mostly about materials. Was it about like how like own a building or how you built it or you know? Yeah. So one lady, she was even crying because she found it so beautiful and the planning also to build their own straw bale house. So that was really nice. And uh, lots, of course, there's lots of everything questions about um, like how it was built and uh, where we got the material from. So yeah, there was, there's so many questions. I can't even name them all, but mainly was the main thing was how the render, like how it keeps it on and yeah. And is it unusual in the Blue Mountains to have a house like that? Well, we're in the uh, Snowy Mountains. The Snowy Mountains, yeah. And I think there's only like, myself, how many? There's maybe three other straw bale houses, not many. And it's really sad because this environment really needs good insulation. I feel sorry for all those Aussies. I don't know, it's so tough. Like I couldn't go in the bathroom. It's so freezing everywhere. Like, man, the Aussies are tough people. We spoil <laughs> us Europeans. And, <laughs> and they use lots of electricity, yeah, to heat the floor heating and stuff. Yeah, but it just shows like, you know, it's been the thing that we've been talking about ever since I was a kid about how Europeans know how to build for cold and we don't have any understanding of it and we keep doing it and we keep building houses that are just not going to be yeah. protecting us. And I've never felt so cold like being in Australia and Australia is definitely not as cold climate as Europe, but I've never mm -hmm. felt so cold as being in houses here in Australia and I'm a consultant and your consultants I go into lots of people's homes and I always get so excited when I come back home to my home because I think man those people are tough people it's like so freezing so before we get into because the time is rolling on before we get into um uh, Q&A questions and I will start to look at some of the questions coming from the audience thank you so much please put your questions into the Q&A and I will try and get to them very soon so before I get to those I just wanted to ask um like it's easy for us to talk about, it's not easy, sorry, it is It is different for us to talk about it being a network of people that are already working amongst people who understand the things that we're talking about and the reasons why we believe in sustainable housing. But how do people approach, like you said, Petra, like how do you approach an architect and get an understanding of whether or not they're going to be the right person for you? Like what are the sort of questions that you can ask of your people of your builder or your designer or your architect that's going to give you a sense of whether or not um they're going to be good for you and or whether or not they have the same I guess it's well, the same, it's the we're same. Lucky. he's a friend of ours and I know where he lives I I know his house I know what the houses other houses he designed so he's the man so we knew straight away he's uh yeah he's our our man to design our home I mean my husband already designed it himself he just you know, did the, the last bit. But for those guys that never have built uh, sustainable, um, I don't know what questions you would ask. I, 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 I have a few ideas because I've, I've dealt with, with, ask them on. <laughs> with, with many, uh, whatever, um, whatever builders and other people. Uh, what I would typically like to say, you know, to ask someone, have you done any sustainable homes? And then, it, you know, they say yes. 
because one big problem is, you know, sustainability and building green is such a trend word. So mm. no matter where you go to, every professional, every website, every architect, builder, designer will say they're sustainable or they do energy efficient things. But there is a lot of greenwash. But if you actually ask someone, you know, and they say yes, then ask you now, what have you done? And if someone tells you, we have done this amazing energy efficient six star home, just turn around and one, because a six star home at the moment is the current legal minimum. If you build anything less than that, it's actually illegal. So a six star home is nothing special. So, you know, that's a, a red flag. Or if they start saying, oh, you know, we put on those solar panels or rainwater tanks on it. Again, that's a red flag that has nothing to do with the efficiency of the home. Mm. So if someone starts to talk about, oh, we put in this and this extra insulation, or we did whatever, this and this seven or eight star home, or we did this thing and this thing, if they have, to, if they can go into detail and this can describe you what they have actually done, then you're on the right track. But um, yeah, so what, like I said, so if someone talks about this energy efficient six star home, mm. turn around, uh, or if they just, yeah, that, that are kind of typical warning signs. And um, we even had in the past that, you know, often, you know, if you end up with a builder like this or with a designer or architect, they can undo many good things that you come in maybe as the client, you know, you have some great um, ideas and then, or even as the designer or architect, you put in the, the good things in the plans and then you have the builder there, oh, you know what, you don't need that much insulation, just take a little bit out and, oh yeah, no, induction cooktop and, and, um, um, and heat pumps, they're actually not that great. Let, put, let's put gas back in again. I can't even tell you some of the stories I heard where, where just the builders talked, you know, the, the clients out of the good things again. So, you know, A, you have to be firm on, you know, what you know is good, mm. but also make sure you have a, a builder, designer, or architect that's on the same page and not just pretends to be because that's the thing to do at the moment. Mm. Uh, Sonia, did you have any? I think, um, yes, I, I absolutely 100% agree. And maybe just to add um, one thing, which is probably not as easy, um, because again, you might need a little bit of knowledge as well, but ask them how they actually um, contribute in their work, in their projects to the location, to the climate specifically. What what is it? What they have chosen in previous projects um, to address actually the climate? I think um, they should be able then, or you should be able to identify very easily if they have deep knowledge and if they have an aim to really um, provide projects um, outcomes that contribute to the right climate solution with your home. I think it comes very quickly. If if they start, you know, talking about all the design things, you know, and the features and everything, you will know there is a missing um, element of of that substantial quality to it, and um, and it will definitely not contribute to the the broad range of energy efficiency of comfort and and so on. But um, if they do dive immediately deep in, because it's it's a trigger um, point, basically, you will have immediately those ones who are passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And it's not that um, a builder, you know, is just doing it for fun. They are really passionate. Some of them are absolutely passionate about um, delivering these better outcomes. And those ones will be diving deep and explaining to you why are they doing the, the things they do in a certain way and how they address, for example, the climate, the specific climate to the location. I think that's a really um, easy way to, to identify the, the good ones <laughs> in the market and, and have a little bit of understanding. Even if, if they tell you things you might not have known previously, it's that local knowledge, which is really important and how they have implemented it in, in their work. Yeah, and I will, um, following on from, from all of your points and from Petra's point as well, though, because it's a 
you know, how do you find these people? It's a very good question. Um, yes, Evertat is a very good place to start to find and build networks. I'll also put a plug in for Natural Building Australia, which is a network that I am part of. Though we're trying to combine people that have a passion for good design and natural materials. And then there's also, of course, Sanctuary Magazine, which has been running for many years and is a great place to look for great designers with great ideas and you know look for people's stories about how they sort of embarked upon their journey and got to the, you know, to, to, to connect with those architects and designers and builds. So yes, I think all of those things are really great suggestions for giving people a way of not only understanding the kind of things that they want to know, but also yet yeah, how to find those people because they are out there and they definitely are working um, in spaces. They're just not often the ones that get found very easy or you get talked, get talked about or get the most press. So I will cut to some of your questions now. Thank you so much, panel. I'm going to put the question from um, Danny, who's asked, how do you balance multi-use practical spaces with resale value? That's a very interesting question. Does uh, do you want to do you want to answer that one, um, <laughs> Simone? Possibly? Oh yeah, yeah. I I think it's just how you frame it. You know, um, I wouldn't say ah oh, the house has only three bedrooms. You know, I would say the house has three bedrooms and has this you know amazing multifunctional space. And you just list all the things you know that could be happening there. And I guess you know if you were to stage it, you have to show what functions could be happening there. So. Um, I think more and more people are looking for that. Um, and a, a funny thing is just a little side note. So, so when I came to Australia, I was actually working for a developer. And we were doing lots of feasibility studies for people that wanted to develop as an investor. And everyone came and said, I need a five bedroom free, um, free bathroom house. And I asked the people, why? You know, how big is your family? And oh yeah, it's just for resale value. Yeah, but how big is your family? Or how many bedrooms do you need? Oh yeah, three. And I think out of whatever 100 people, maybe only 10 or 20% really needed this five bedrooms. But everyone kept saying, we need five bedrooms for resale value. And I just question you now, why? Just because the real estate agent says you need a five bedroom house? You know, it's nonsense. Most, you know, most people, families don't need these big houses. You know, you just think about what do you want to attract? You know, if you are just whatever, a, a couple or, you know, a family with one child, then maybe the two or the three bedroom house is all that you need. And so you build a three bedroom house and there will be plenty of families that are similar to you that will need exactly the same. Mm. Maybe I can just add one thing. Um, so I, would also, think... sorry, I would also support never taking advice from real estate agents. That's just... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, maybe just... A, um, the, the messaging we have been exposed in the sense of resale value are entirely driven by, you know, real estate um, sector. There is a monetization behind it. We need to be clear about this. Um, but the other part is also like the future. What, what it holds is um, mandatory energy efficiency um, disclosure. We are talking, even finance institutions are talking about um, even mandatory um, climate risk disclosure around properties. So just be aware of how that might actually shape and change also the property market, the real estate market. Um, there is pre pressing um, or like an um, additional um, pressure point building up also on insurances um, to identify property at risk. And I'm not just talking about properties in regional areas or, you know, rural areas. That's in the middle of cit uh, cities and urban environments um, where insurance, um, you know, like the premiums are rising. And it adds actually... Um, modeling data, very simple, you know, to, to the property and the risk assessments around this. So when properties become um, unaffordable in terms of insurance, or they get actually um, red marked and you won't get an insurance policy anymore. I think that's the tipping point um, really to look deeper into the property and, and our obsession with asset um, and investments around this sector. Like Australia is very unique in that um, space. 
like there's a lot of capital invested in property. So mm. don't underestimate this, um, but none of these systems are maybe forever. So systems can change through these influences and climate mm. change is putting a lot of pressure on, on everything at the moment. While we might not see them um, currently, you know, pandering out in the market really in terms of um, clear property prices, it is coming because there's an international pressure as well on reporting obligations. There's also risk assessment across the sector from insurances to finance, and that will put um, pressure onto the property market. So the way how you respond today and how you make these investments in your homes will largely contribute actually to better outcomes in the future around your property investment. And that's a really important part to consider um, also in, in that investment strategy, I think, and be aware of if, if you want to put these dots together. Mm. And just to, I just thought maybe it might be worth clarifying why um, mandatory um, disclosure is going to be a significant problem for some for Australian housing is because it is going to really, you know, start comparing. You'll be able to see very clearly the efficiency, the energy efficiency of housing when they get a rating. There'll be a nationalised, or hopefully eventually there'll be a nationalised rating system that puts a rating on all houses, and that includes rentals as well. And that will mean that you'll be able to see from the outset how much it's going to cost to manage and maintain the energy of that home. And I think it's really going to show um, show up poorly designed, large, overblown houses for how inefficient they are, and that's going to drop their prices. So, yes. Sorry, Petra, please go. Oh, did you mute? Sorry. Uh, our uh, uh, number is 8.5 energy efficiency. Mm. And it goes to show you said you're we're already into almost May and you're in Jindabyne and you haven't had to put any heating on. It's pretty incredible. Um we I've, can't I've, wait because I cook with timber. We've got an agar and it's like uh, we can't wait to cook dinner on it, you know, but it's like not oh, cold enough. <laughs> it's not cold enough and then you'll get too hot. All right. I'll keep I'll keep moving through some of the questions. There's a great question here that was put anonymously, but um I think it really brings together some of the Topics that we've talked about in and could uh, give people quite a succinct way. Um, I'd love your guests to explain who you need on your team to create the dream team. Mm. So maybe just to outline those people. Would you do that for us, Simone? Yes, yeah, so I would definitely say, you know, a designer or architect who knows about sustainable design and the basics. Uh, and I'm personally, I'm a huge passive house fan. So I would say, you know, the person should ideally know something about building physics and how to avoid humidity and mold in your home. That would be great. Um, but definitely passive solar design basics, I think, are a must. Uh, I also would say that uh, energy efficiency should not be an afterthought. So um, what I would typically say is either use the energy waiter early on in the process to help you model and weight your house really to optimize energy efficiency. Or what we have done um, or what we do is uh, use the passive house calculation tool, the passive house planning package to also optimize and fine tune the efficiency because early on in the process, it's, it's a really simple process. You know, you can optimize your window location, your window sizes, how much insulation is ideal. Um, what shading can you have? Um, is, you know, or what, what do you, can you do with eaves or even uh, plants or indoor shading, you know, really optimize your design early on. So either uh, energy waiter or a passive house consultant, and then a builder that are kind of the minimum things. And obviously, you know, on top of that, you need your structural engineer. Um, and ideally, when it comes to costing and, you know, making your home affordable, you should, should have a really good relationship between your designer architect, your builder, and ideally some involvement with the structural engineer to optimize um, what um, the, the structure and the build cost. And then depending on what you do, you might need a private planner, you might need or want a landscape designer, landscape architect, you might want an interior designer. And ideally, um, you know, the, the more the team works together, you know, however you the big your team is, the more congruent the outcome will be. Mm. So you don't think that there can be too many um, cooks? I, I think you need one who's kind of a bit in charge, maybe <laughs> it's yeah. just a, as a bit of a guiding line. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, that it doesn't get too confusing. 
But again, it goes back then that your brief is really, really clear. So for instance, I have heard this a story a while ago. I can't remember where it was, but it was a big project and a big new home. And there were lots of trees on site. And one of the main briefs for the client was, we love, love, love the site. There are the amazing trees. You know, We have the most beautiful outlook. It will be such a great garden. And then they engaged the demolition company. And no one taught the demolition company properly how important those trees are. The mm. demolition company came in and just cleared the entire site. Mm. And it just shows, you know, how important it would have been maybe just to have one discussion with that contractor. And it, it could be, you know, something completely else, you know, just say, okay, this is our brief. This is what we want to achieve on site. You know, please go ahead. Um, so sometimes it's quite good to have, you know, at, at least be clear what are our goals or, you know, what is our main brief. Um, and on that, I'll just go to a second question and maybe, Sonia, you might be able to answer this one from Paul who's asking the order of said things. So he has a design um, that he wants, he has land and where he wants to build it and preferred materials, but what is the best order to engage, says he's going around in circles. So um, that's a great question. So, so based on a lot of... Um, renovation journeys we we came across also i think there's one question to ask if it's an off-grid building for example if you aim completely to go off-grid i think your water system and how it's designed where is it placed is a really critical part to the land you have um, so if if you're not building on you know an, an acreage or something then that system is quite critical. Um, so I think um, there is pro possible, I, I know it sounds strange, but we we have come across also of um, a city, uh, small block, you know, wanting to go off grid. And that's exactly where you need to think carefully, how do you actually manage your water supply? How, how do you manage... Um, the placement of, of tanks, the system itself, and so on. So water is probably um, a really high um, task to, to get it right in the first place and then structuring um, other things underneath. But it's, a, again, a guiding element of the design and everything. Unless you have such a big land and you can basically decide wherever you want to put things. Um, so again, it really depends on, on the size of the land and certain constraints you might work with or you have um, to, to manage in the design and in the build. Um, in term, Yeah, I think in terms of, of these priorities, um, certain system designs are quite essential and they are really, again, based on what do you want to achieve? And then they become basically an integral part of the process and also the way how you engage actually these experts um, in the order. Because you wouldn't then want to have um, a water expert in the middle or in, at the end and they're telling you, hang on, your whole design doesn't work because we can't actually fit the water system in. It's just not workable. Yeah. Um, to avoid these loops, and often enough, I think um, that happens really um, in, in a lot of cases, you start somewhere because you think, okay, that might be something to start with, but it turns out actually it's a wrong order. Mm. So um, I guess, you know, like I don't have answers in, in every um, design or renovation journey, but I know that um, water is a critical part. It depends entirely, actually, if, if you want to go completely off grid and um, self-supply. But um, if that's the case, consider that as, as an um, early on element of um, getting right, getting engaging also the experts and then designing around it. Um, same also applies probably to other off-grid solutions. Um, be aware of not to, to put them as an afterthought in because then it becomes more complicated and you might need to do adjustments to the entire design to, to make it workable. Um, avoid these things. They are 
costly. They are not good, actually. And you're wasting money. I feel like there's going to be those stories in every build where it, you know, if we'd have planned it differently, we might have saved ourselves that money. And if we'd have done more thinking around this, we might have saved that money. And I mean, guess that leads into Monica's question, which is about how much more expensive is it to engage a team with interests in sustainable building and design? And what is the hourly price difference? I mean, I guess it's a piece of string sort of question, but how do you weigh up the relative benefits? And I guess this is about you know, how do we as a as a community and as a network support people to make these decisions as being cost beneficial for them? Yeah. Simone, I feel you're nodding at yeah. this one. I think it's a bit of a tricky question, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, you know, but, but people typically would do is, yeah, you know, you just get your, in, in, in brackets, you know, you get just your designer, architect and your builder, you get everything done. And then at the end, you go to all your consultants, you know, it might be then whatever, you know, if you go off the grid, it might be your water, your, 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 your solar panel, or um, it might be your, your, your town planner or whatever it is, you know, typically you do everything. And at the end, you get kind of the tick items for the permits. But, and that might be the most cost-effective way because, you know, you just pay them whatever for a report. Um, but like you said, Rachel, often, you know, it turns out that, you know, I should have done this, I should have done that, or if I would have known that, you know, sometimes projects go perfectly and everything goes well, but yeah. I think that barely ever happens. You know, yeah. usually there are some things that you just don't know. So in theory, you know, it, it makes much more sense to get, you know, wherever you get the architect designer or the builder first, and then you get the second. But I think those two are kind of the, the first you need. But then as soon as you have a bit of an idea what you want to do, ideally, you get everyone on board. And the thing is, then you probably have to pay them a little bit more because, you know, they're not just producing a report. So typically, there is a bit of consultancy or work or liaison between the team. But that's where the magic can happen. That is where you can find problems early on. That's where you can figure out what's the best best solution, what is the most cost-effective solution. Because otherwise, if everything is set in stone and you just need them to set up a report or you know set up a system, that might not the most cost. It's most likely not the most cost-effective solution for your property or for your house. It's just the one that fits to your design. Mm. So therefore, it's a bit of yeah, you know, chicken and egg thing. Do do you rather spend say whatever thousand dollar more in design fees up front, but then your system is ten thousand dollar cheaper? It's, it's, it's kind of hard to, to quantify exactly how much it is, but that's how you typically get better outcomes. Again, you know, you might be really lucky that everything goes smoothly, but I must say in all my years that barely ever happens. And that goes back to what Sonia said before about, you know, if you're asking about climate and you're asking about, you know, is this house going to suit this place or this location or this landscape, you'll be able to make those kind of um cost saving um analyses around how much you're actually going to save by building a house that's actually going to work for the climate like I was thinking before when you were talking Sonia about future proofing our housing you know yes of course um bushfires and floods and all of the things that do affect more regional parts but thinking about heat waves and just thinking about all of our housing that is just not built for you know, what happens when the power goes down and what happens when we have to spend two or three days without power and people are dying and sweltering in their homes, then, you know, that's a real problem. And we're going to be dealing with a lot more of that kind of uncertainty and probably climate emergency stuff into the future. Um, I'll move on, but I have... There's a good question here from Pamela about asking if any of the panelists have been involved in designing houses designed for physical disabilities and or ageing in place and what issues or recommendations could be made for thinking about that. Oh, yeah, we, we have done a bit uh, recently. We've done quite a bit with special disability accommodation, uh, which is, you know, more purpose built for NDIS participants. And um, yeah, I don't want to uh, talk about, about all the different standards now, but you know, you can look them up, you know, the silver standard and the gold standard. And it's, it's, it's kind of the basics that you make sure that there is enough clearance everywhere, that you have a bit wider hallways, that your doorways are a little bit wider. And, other, um, and if you do those things early on, they actually don't add any more money or just slightly. And the other big thing is that you just prepare your bathrooms for future so so let's say you know that you have extra pricing inside the walls that later on if you have to fix crap or something you can just do it and bathrooms don't have to be redone 
Um, so there are quite a few things that can be done easily without adding lots of money. But if you had to add them later on, that gets really expensive. So just be, you know, maybe do a bit of research and then make sure you communicate it to your designer, architect and builder. It's definitely something that really good designers and architects are thinking about in terms of especially the age of the clients mm -hmm. that are moving into the house and whether or not that's something that they're going to be dealing with or thinking about into the future. Um, and, and, and maybe just saying that just, just one simple thing, what I would always, always do, because, you know, now that we are building smaller in inner city that, you know, to, and we often go double story, what I would always, always say, have at least one room where someone can sleep downstairs and one bathroom that's accessible. And then often people say, ah, oh, but you know, we're young, we can go up the stairs. But even if you're young, you know, you might just break a leg and you're not able to go up the stairs for quite a few weeks or something, you know? So that that as a minimum, you know, make at least sure there's one accessible bathroom and one room where someone can sleep, you know, that is as a minimum. Mm. Maybe on, on that note, just to add, um, for example, the logbook um, within the, the platform we are providing is actually capturing these design decisions. Um, so for example, if you have put um, and worked with, with an expert um, on getting it right in the first place or even modifying your home to meet these needs, um, you can add that information. And at the point of, of sale, you can demonstrate, you can show, you can inform the real estate agent to highlight these things. And then to be actually an accessible information point for someone who is looking for, for properties like that. I think mm. we, we really need to change these dynamics in the market and then um, addressing a range of, of needs um, instead of constantly just, you know, chasing that one luxury thing. Mm. Um, because we, we are all humans with so many different needs. And um, I think it's really important to, to address that and have a range of solutions. Mm. Um, there's a couple more questions. We're going to be running out of time very Soon. I will just say with some of the questions that are going into the Q&A, we do have seven more sessions that are going to be covering a whole range of topics coming up. And I can see a lot of the questions in the Q&A will be answered in detail in many of the sessions coming up, especially we've got uh, one on design this week and there's another one on materials the following week. There's another one on co-housing and DIY and owner building. So there's a lot of opportunities to ask these questions in um, future Sustainable House Day sessions. So do not worry if your questions do not get answered tonight. Um, the One of the last questions that I wanted to put to um, put to you um, <laughs> um okay so I mean we have gone over this but I feel like since we've got not much time is there a checklist of categories or factors to think through in considering a design it's a very broad question and I know it's a big can of worms but can you just run through the the basic overviews of um categories and a lot of them we've already talked about tonight so I guess maybe just put it into a concise checklist if you wouldn't mind sorry to run through this again yeah, yeah. <laughs> so maybe you could start um I think look Simona will be probably even being able to, <laughs> to put that in a concise thing um I think orientation you know is the number one um tick um in on my checklist you know and that applies not just to a new build but also to retrofitting changing things you know like in renovations um utilize that utilize solar passive um uh, passive solar principles and um because that makes a big difference and and knowing actually um how to you to make the best out of it um the other part is really the space itself Often enough, it's not necessarily um, a bad building, it's a bad layout. So you can engage yeah. someone really to change that. And I think there are some brilliant examples on the market who tap into that need to, to keep actually our existing buildings, to extend the life of, of these buildings, but to change and make that space more 
purposeful, more uh, utilized um, for the needs of the, the, the owners, um, the families uh, who are occupying it. Um, and then considering, you know, um, things which are essential, um, natural light, natural um, air ventilation, all these things which might not need um, additional system solution, better thermal performance. Um, these things are really essential. It taps exactly in what you also mentioned, Rachel, for example, to, to create that resilience, um, even in urban environments um, around heat waves and so on. Except for Victoria, every single state in Australia has been exposed this summer really to heat waves. Yeah. And we will see these crazy weather patterns more often. So put this high up on your priority if you want to have a really comfortable and a livable home. And if you have to spend some money, um, prioritize these things. So. And Petra, do you have a, a quick checklist of the things that you would prioritize or you have prioritized for your home build? Well, the most important thing for us was the sun, you know, using the sun. And then recycled materials? <laughs> oh, yes. Sorry, it's getting late. My brain is not working. <laughs> well, that's all right. So it was the materials, it was orientation and the materials. Yeah. And then also, I'm assuming because you, you had to be able to do it yourself. That was the other aspect. Of <laughs> and Simone? Yeah, so I would, yeah, definitely a passive solar design. So, you know, use the sun's free energy as best as you can, you know, to help you uh, warm the house in winter, but also keep cool in summer in terms of shading and eaves and all those kind of things. But on top of that, you know, insulation is kind of the, the low hanging fruit, you know, put in lots of insulation, you know, never, ever go with the legal minimum requirements, you know, they're, they're just the legal minimum requirements, put in as much insulation yep. as possible. Also, one of my biggest tips is spend as much money as you can on the windows, because, you know, you will, you, you, you can update your kitchen again in 10, 20 years, uh, but you will never, ever touch the windows again. And what most people don't know, even the best triple glazing, or even if you would have a quad triple glazing, it's not as good as a wall. So windows will always be the weak point. So spend as much money on that. Um, and definitely draft ceiling. Again, another low hanging fruit, you know, it's fa fairly easy to be done. Doesn't need, uh, cost lots of money. If uh, you want to go a little bit further, then, you know, look into uh, getting the house airtight and mechanical and ventilation. But that's, you know, a completely different topic that that would, uh, you know, be too much for tonight. Uh, but, you know, that's then the next big thing on the list that for me, I think is really important when it comes to health. Um, because what we have to be careful with, if we start to make our homes more airtight and we trap air inside, that when, when we can create lots of issue and which can lead to humidity and mold lead up. And again, don't want to talk too much about it, but if someone is interested, look up sick buildings in Rome because it has happened in Europe 30 years ago. It's, it's happening in New Zealand where houses are full of mold and people are getting really sick and you definitely don't want to get to that point. Definitely. And I, I think I've I've heard your your call for us to take health measures far more seriously than we have tonight, Simone, and I hope that that's something that all of our guests um, can take away with them. So I'll ask just um, as we wrap up now, um, if all of you fam fabulous panellists could give us the the number one takeaway. I feel like you just sort of gave us your, your important checklist, but the number one takeaway for taking one's dream to the drawing board to get it from out of our heads and onto paper and into something that we actually want to live in. Uh, I'll start with you, Sonia. The number one takeaway, um, I think, so if I would put into the spot to, uh, you know, build a home, it's really, I think I would really want something which is just right, um, which is, you know, not too big. I don't want to leave that, you know, mansion behind and that bad legacy attached to it. I would actually want to, to get it right. And I would always put myself, the family in the center point. What needs this building to deliver to, to me in the first place? Um, what are these needs? So um, I think that's 
a guiding beacon for me, definitely. Um, and I, I guess that will then also um, basically contribute to decision making. But conscious choices, um, think of you are in, in the driving seat of spending money and do it wisely. So it's a, it's a great moment, you know, that, that's the biggest moment you pro possible have in, in your lifetime to do things consciously and to make a huge contribution to climate action. So it's, mm. it's your moment. <laughs> I love that. Um, Petra, do you have one thing that you would like people to take away from tonight? Well, for me, it's the most important thing is when you walk in a home, it is cosy, practical, like beautiful air. So when people come, I love having people over and it's so nice when people come and feel happy. And because if I believe if I'm happy and feel comfortable in my home, I'm going to be nicer to people around me. So the world <laughs> will be a better place if people will be happy and cosy. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that 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 is beautiful. Thank you. And Simone, your last takeaway? Yeah, so definitely, you know, health and thermal comfort is really important. But what I think is also important to think about whatever you do a renovation or a new build, what you're building now should not just be up to the current standard. It should be there for future generations to come. So try to build the homes that they, you know, last, not just for yourself, but ideally maybe for your children or, you know, for for, for the children's children, you know, you, you don't want to, you don't want to build a home now that whatever, when temperatures go up, that you're suddenly smoldering inside. And then, you know, that it has to be renovated again in 10, 20 or 30 years, you know, it needs to be fit for purpose and it needs to be, you know, future proof. Um, and what I always find funny is, you know, um, when you compare again with Australia, you know, homes and overseas and, and in Europe, you know, I'm born in Germany as well. Uh, homes are just typically so much better in Europe. And what I often question is, you know, no one would buy a car that just scrapes by, that just keeps you alive. You know, you have your front airbag and your side airbag and your whatever, all the fancy things inside, you know, just to keep you safe. But when it comes to renovating or building a home, people are often happy just with the absolute legal minimum standard. And I think mm. that needs to change. You know, it's the biggest investment we ever make. Obviously, you know, it costs money, but we don't just want the minimum legal standard. We want the best, you know, we want the whatever Mercedes, Ferraris or whatever you want to call it, you know, but you know, you, you want something really good that will stand the test of time and will keep you, your family and, you know, the, the family after you safe and happy and healthy. Awesome. Thank you. And I think I'll, I'll add one more to that list, which is what I've heard from all of you tonight, which is really about picking your team wisely and how much that dis those decisions will definitely impact the way your project will go and move forward and hopefully be the, the, the most beneficial for you and for the environment and also um, for your stress levels. So I'll say goodbye to our wonderful panellists. Um, that brings us to the end of our session. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again to the sponsor for tonight's session, the New South Wales Architects Registration Board, and that we hope that all of you who have been very active tonight will join us for Thursday's session when the focus is on acing the basics of a sustainable build, looking at orientation, insulation and airflow. And please don't forget to join up to Renew and subscribe to one of our magazines, Renew or Sanctuary, to get the best independent, sustainable news to your door. You can follow the link in the chat to get on board. Thank you. Good night.